on the shore of Little Bay de Noc in Delta County. So it's a small city often recognized for its rich history and coastal charm. Yet few know the eerie stories and forgotten legends that haunt this upper Michigan town. In this episode of Sightseeing Sally, we explore a few of these tales while discovering some of the historic places that make this haunted upper Michigan city so eerily charming. Hey Sightseers, Sightseeing Sally here and... Marty. Today we're checking out... The Winter Wonderland town called Escanaba in Michigan. <gasps> And Winter Wonderland is right. That's why we're all dressed up here, bundled up, because it's what? Shifting between 48 and 52 degrees today. Woohoo! <laughs> Enjoying this. Definitely. But today we're here in Escanaba because Escanaba, if you didn't know, has a lovely historic district. Not to mention, there are some really interesting ghost stories to be had since we're heading up into spooky season. Let's go check it out. To start things off, we're checking out the Sandpoint Lighthouse. On the National Register of Historic Places, the lighthouse was built starting in the fall of 1867 and finishing up in the spring of 1868. A man by the name of John Terry was the newly appointed lighthouse keeper. However, John would never end up actually manning the lighthouse. Shortly before the lighthouse was to be lit for the first time, he became very ill and ended up dying. His wife, Mary, ended up becoming appointed as the replacement lighthouse keeper, and she manned the lighthouse for the next 19 years. Because of the time frame, women weren't normally appointed as lighthouse keepers and some of the political leaders of the town actually opposed Mary becoming the lighthouse keeper. But that really didn't matter to the rest of the townsfolk. Mary was well liked, well respected, and she took her job seriously. She did an excellent job being one of the first women to man a lighthouse on the Great Lakes. Along this wind-whipped shore of Lake Michigan's Little Bay de Noc, Mary Terry diligently kept the light burning bright until 1886, when her life story took a tragic turn. You see, a mysterious fire broke out, and Mary ended up losing her life in the fire. Upon investigating the cause of the fire, officials discovered the south entrance door showed signs of forced entry. Although none of Mary's valuables were missing, her body was oddly found in the oil room. At the time, people suspected foul play. However, to this day, no one really knows what happened. According to an article in the Iron Port, the coroner's jury came to the conclusion that Mrs. Terry came to her death by means and causes unknown. Of course, the story of Mary Terry doesn't end there. According to local legend, the lighthouse is said to be haunted by her spirit. Mary's spirit isn't the only ghost that's alleged to be haunting this piece of land. Some claim the spirit of a former Menominee Indian chief haunts this area as well. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but several sources on the web indicate that this land where the lighthouse was built may have been at one time sacred burial grounds of the Menominee Indian tribe. According to a transcription found on genealogytrails.com, there may be some truth to this story. The Western Historical Company wrote in 1883 that in 1865, a tomb of an ancient Indian chief was discovered in the grove just south of the Tilden House. For those who don't know, the Tilden House used to be a large frame building located in the 300 block of Ogden Avenue, less than a half mile from the lighthouse. And note, I said may have. 
You know how it is when acquiring information off the web. You can't believe everything that's stated out there. But I just want to mention it just because it is part of the legend and lore are surrounding this area. My favorite thing is when I come to find these lighthouses wherever they're at, I look at the lens up in the tower there, them friends in the lenses. I know 20 years ago when I was looking them up, I don't know why I always wanted one. Besides the tornado siren, I always wanted one and they were tens of thousands of dollars if you could even find one. Built at a cost of $11,000, the Sandpoint Lighthouse operated for nearly 71 years before it was deactivated in 1939 when the Coast Guard installed an automated crib light several hundred feet offshore. I want you to look down here once. How many times do you see these sitting in yards or whatever? You know what that is? That's an old horse hitching post that's extremely old. That's where they used to hitch them to when the ring's on there. Pretty neat stuff. One last thing that's interesting to note about the lighthouse before we move on is you'll notice it was built facing inland and not over the water. Since it was built so long ago, people don't know if that was an engineering mistake or intentional. But regardless, it is one of those things that makes this lighthouse so unique that people marvel over it. Continuing on, we make our way to Ludington Park, though I couldn't find any documentation supporting the notion that this particular area was haunted too. There is a certain spiritual quality that can often be found in places like this. Off in the distance, you can see what I believe is the second tallest building in all of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a part of Escanaba Central Historic District, which we're gonna head to Next, but first I wanted to show you around this really neat park that's located here. A park that includes its own man-made island. Ludington Park evolved in part out of a 1930s Works Progress Administration project. During that project, Sand Point was extended, shoreline areas filled, and an island created using sand dredged from the yacht harbor. One of Escanaba's gems Aronson Island Park, or Ludington Park as it's better known, is the perfect place to get your beach on. As much as I'd love to sit out here all day soaking in the sun, listening to the waves over the sound of the lawnmower, we're going to move on. We've got a historical district to explore, right Marty? Let's do it. We're now over at the House of Ludington, which marks the start of the Central Historic District. Often referred to as the Lady of the Lakefront or the Great White Castle, the House of Ludington is one of the oldest hotels in all of Michigan. On the National Register of Historic Places, the House of Ludington was originally built sometime around 1864 by Nelson Gaynor. Since then, the hotel has been enlarged and modernized by its various owners. And just like the lighthouse, it is supposedly haunted. The ghost, one of the former owners, Pat Hayes. Pat Hayes, a Boston native, reportedly bought the hotel in 1939. An ambitious man, Pat worked many long hours acting as host, chef, and manager. A colorful character, Pat had the reputation of refusing to serve a well-done steak. Known as one of Michigan's best hotel owners, Pat died from cancer at the age of 73, 30 years after buying his beloved hotel. Besides having the reputation of being haunted, the historic house of Ludington has housed some very interesting guests over the years, including Al Capone, Jimmy Hoffa, Babyface Nelson, the Fords, and Johnny Cash. Supposedly, Al Capone was a regular guest here, and Pat Hayes, the owner who reportedly haunts the hotel, he would act 
as Al Capone's personal chef. According to legend, Al Capone stayed in the front turret of the hotel. People claim there is a hidden stairwell strategically placed between windows with views of the sheriff's department and courthouse that acted as Capone's escape route when he needed it. Allegedly, Capone used the city's underground network of steam tunnels to run booze during Prohibition. Whether you believe the tales or not is entirely up to you, but one thing's certain. The historic House of Ludington is one of those places that helped put Escanaba on the map. Leaving the historic House of Ludington behind, we're now over on the 400 block of Ludington, where you have the city of Escanaba, city hall and library and the Spindler Services building that's housed in a late Victorian commercial style building that was built in 1887. And then up ahead we have that tall building that we could see all the way from Ludington Park. Known as the Harbor Tower Apartments, this building stands 18 stories tall and is the second tallest building in all of Upper Michigan. Unsure whether there have been any reports of hauntings in the vicinity of the high-rise, we continue down Ludington, stopping only to note places of personal or historic interest. And things up my alley is this old elk sign that's porcelain and neon. I love them signs. Something else that's interesting to note is etched on the glass of some of the windows is a clock that shows the time of 11. I find that interesting. Does anybody know if that means something special? You can see it's over here as well. And then just down the block from the Elks Club, you have this building, now the home of Ludington Post Suites. It used to house the United States Post Office. And if you look closely above the door, you can see it once said U.S. Post Office. This next section of Ludington Street has a number of historic buildings. You have the former location of WKX 104.7 FM along with the Eagles Club. I can see Marty's just dying to tell us about something. What's on your mind, Marty? <laughs> that neon sign. Look at that baby. Oh, it changes. Just ask. Just ask. I spy something with my little eye. You care to guess what it might be? Here's an old survey marker on the side of this building. Some of these buildings are just unbelievable. This building's quite old. If you actually look at the top of these columns, 18 on this side, 90 on that side, just think that they hand carved that just for that. They didn't have CNC's back then in programming to make those. A lot of work goes into these old buildings. The one I like is the one on the right here. You can kind of see the tile work in it going all the way up. Reminds me of the 50s. If I'm not mistaken, the building that's next to it, right on the corner, was once the location of the Delta Motel. Now it's home to Delta Apartments and Hereford and Hops Restaurant and Brew Pub. Another thing I like is when you still see these old fire escapes on the building. Pretty cool. I'm surprised Marty didn't point this out to you. If I'm not mistaken, that's an old alarm of some sorts. He must have been just too busy ogling over that old fire escape. Unfortunately, we're starting to lose daylight, so I feel like we're having to run and pass by some of the historic buildings that are in this block here. But, you know, you kind of get a taste of what Escanaba has in terms of its historic district. Perhaps by not showing you or talking about everything here, maybe it'll pique your curiosity enough that you'll want to come down and check it out yourself. In front of me is the Escanaba National Bank, or what used to be the Escanaba National Bank. You can see its style is very similar to the old bank building that we saw down in. Old Shawneetown. It definitely reminds me a lot of that bank. 
Yeah, all that's missing are the stately front steps leading up to it. Now we're coming up to one of Marty's favorite types of buildings, the old Michigan Theater. With the old neon and the incandescent light bulbs underneath the marquee that usually flash. Man, this is right up his alley. I'm surprised he's not over here trying to figure out a way to buy it like he has in the past. Yeah, I probably should go over there and see if I can get one for my old man boobs. Well, I should clarify that. He hasn't actually bought a theater building, but he has bought a bunch of theater equipment in the past. We may even have some of it still in our basement somewhere. Oh goody, they're gonna have a haunted house here October 13th through the 14th. You won't catch me hitting up that haunted house. There's a story behind that, but I don't think I'm gonna share that with you. I'd be too embarrassed. Actually, she went through a haunted house while she was in high school and she cried like a little baby. He ain't lying. <laughs> I cried so hard, especially at the moment when the guy lit up that chainsaw. <laughs> I started screaming. I screamed so bad that they actually had to stop the haunted house <laughs> and let me go through because I was in hysterics. Let's just say haunted houses and I don't, don't agree with one another in that I get way too scared. And just like that, we're at another theater here in Escanaba. Isn't this a cool building, Marty? Yeah, actually it is. I believe this was for sale a few years back. I don't remember what, how much, but it was. I'm surprised you didn't try to buy it. I looked at it. Why am I not surprised? We're now over on South 7th Street, just a block down from Ludington Avenue. And we're over here because just like Iron Mountain, there happens to be a Carnegie Library here. Built in 1902, the building no longer houses the library, but rather is privately owned and is supposedly being renovated into some sort of living quarters. It's kind of interesting, up until recently when we did the video on Iron Mountain, I had no idea the amount of influence Carnegie had in building so many libraries across the United States. And really, up until we ran into the one in Iron Mountain, I didn't even know Carnegie was into building libraries. And now, oddly, in a matter of only a few weeks, we've run into our second one. I'm thinking we've got a new challenge on our hands, sightseers. Seeing as the library is one of my all-time favorite places to hang out, going forward, let's see how many Carnegie libraries we can come across. Oh, look, there's something you don't see too often anymore. A sign for a fallout shelter. Before I was a big YouTuber, I used to see the sign all day, every day, working in the nuclear industry. Now that I've been out of it a few years, whenever I run across one, I find myself getting a little bit of a thrill. I'm sure I'm not the only one that knows what that is. Let's go find out what Marty has to say about it. You know you're old is when you know what that fallout shelter actually means. And you remember hiding under your desks in school Cold War era stuff. I don't know when exactly it started, probably back in the 50s, but I definitely remember in the late 70s, early 80s, having drills in school. Yeah, I hate to say it, Marty, but we're getting old. Yep. As interesting as it was to see the sign for the fallout shelter, I just want to point out that the church itself is historic. Known as St. Joseph's Church, it was built in 1939 and predates the Cold War. Wow, what's some beautiful architecture. I just find these old churches to be such incredible pieces from our history. One last thing I want to point out before we move on from here, and that is we're standing at the very site of the first public schoolhouse that was erected in Escanaba in 1867. 
And interestingly enough, the tablet that's here marking the site is also an old relic. If you look at the date, you can see it was placed here in 1934. That was almost 100 years ago. I have to say, sightseers, we are standing at the trifecta of sites because we have the marker commemorating the first schoolhouse, the former Carnegie Library, and last but not least, some holy water blessing our sights. Honestly, I have no idea why the holy water is sitting there, but I have to say that is a first for me. I have never seen holy water just sitting out about randomly, not even across the street from a church. So it just strikes me as a little bit odd, unless there's something supernatural about this site and somebody placed holy water there because of it. But then again, maybe not. Maybe I've just been watching too many paranormal shows. If you know, let us know. We'd like to know. What's the story behind the holy water? You know what, sightseers? It just occurred to me a possible reason for why that holy water was placed over there. Directly across the street is this building and it's reportedly haunted. Known as the William Boniface Fine Arts Center Theater, local legend claims that William's wife, Catherine, haunts the theater. Supposedly, she didn't like guns, and there have been instances during plays when prop guns have malfunctioned. And then there are the strange sounds that can be heard late at night. People claim you can hear the sounds of footsteps when there's nobody else around. Spooky, huh? Here's something else that's kind of spooky. Something for you to ponder on as you're trying to fall asleep tonight. As I've been filming here, I use my iPhone to do all my filming and oddly, it's been acting up. You know, freezing up, just doing weird things, quirky things. Granted, that could be easily explained. You know, we just had an update to a new operating system, but it is kind of funny that it's happening now and happening here at this site, especially when you factor in the holy water across the street. And all this time I thought fake haunted houses were something to be afraid of. Maybe I need to revisit that. Something to keep in mind are the words of Ryan Gosling. He says, I think I had an overactive imagination and I was so convinced that those around me became convinced to Well, looky here, an explanation as to who the Bonifaces were and their connection to the theater, which coincidentally wasn't originally a theater, it was an auditorium and gymnasium. Both poor immigrants, William and Catherine Boniface made their fortune through various investments, including the formation of a logging company that they later sold to Kimberly Clark for a quarter of a million dollars. Having no children, they became major philanthropists, financing the construction of St. Joseph's Church and the building of a gymnasium and auditorium for the church's parochial school, which is now used as the Fine Arts Center. A few more historic church buildings before we move on. This one is the First Presbyterian Church. According to its cornerstone, this church has been active in Escanaba since 1899. I don't know if the church building itself has been here since 1899, hence I worded it as such. And then just a few blocks farther down, you have Bethany Lutheran Church. Established in 1879, this church was built in 1912. There must have been a lot of money coming through Escanaba at that point in time because it appears they didn't spare no expense when building this church. You've got all the brickwork, the stained glass, and I imagine the inside is just as beautiful as the outside. Now there's a house that gives off haunted vibes if I ever did see one. 
I certainly don't mean it as a dig against the people who own it now. It just reminds me of something you would see in an old black and white film, an old horror film. And rounding out the roster of historic buildings sitting here at the corner of 11th and 1st Ave is what used to be City Hall. On the National Register of Historic Places, the former City Hall and Firehouse was built 1902. This must have been the end where the firehouse was because if you look up there, you can see it says Hose House number one. For a town with a population of only 12,000 or so, Escanaba has a lot of history here, a lot of old historic buildings. For example, over there, you can see on the back of that building an advertisement indicating that that used to be a drugstore. With so many different sites to see in Escanaba, it can be quite easy for sightseers to lose track of time. Being that that's the case, I'm going to point out one more thing over here and then we're going to move on. First and foremost, I want to point out the sign that's in the foreground pointing out where Dr. Nancy Chenoweth's office used to stand. Apparently, Dr. Chenoweth, who was a native of Canada, was one of only four women physicians who practiced in Delta County during a time when most medical practitioners were men. And then behind that is the former AT&T building, built during an era when cell phones were non-existent. We're now back up on Ludington Avenue. I thought I'd quickly point out some of the businesses that are over on this end. You've got your St. Vincent de Paul store, the Quality Sew and Vac. I wonder if that's what a vacuum center is like in Breaking Bad for a hundred grand. You can get a new identity, move you to a new town. I need a dust filter for a Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. Moving on. There's also a couple of specialty shops like the East Ludington Gallery, Schwalbach Kitchens, Curiosity Shop, Trinkets and Treasures, The Beaten Path where you can get your bicycle, disc golf, and skateboard needs taken care of, and then of course Great Lakes Fitness on the very end. You'll notice I conveniently left out any mention of Mary Jane's stores. We are up in the land of legalization. However, from what I've been seeing as we've been passing them, they don't need any additional advertising from me. One thing I wanted to point out is when you're walking around downtown here and you're checking out the cool old historic buildings is that you want to keep your eyes peeled for old, oh, murals painted on the sides of some of these buildings. For example, the one that's painted on the side of the Ludington Center. You can see the remains of one that was painted back in August of 99, showing the founder of Escanaba to be Eli P. Royce. And then you have the one on the side of this building, it says Escanaba, founded 1863. Kind of reminds me of a postcard highlighting some of the important industries of this area. You know, you got your schooner from the Great Lakes, the old steam engine from when the trains arrived, and then the logging industry that was so prevalent up here. You can check out the old Viking sprinkler alarm up there that goes off and they got a fire. That's pretty cool. I haven't seen one of them in a long time. Do you think it still works? I doubt it. It's more of her looks. They don't want a hole in the building anymore. That's what it's that's why it's still there. Here's another mural. This one's looking a little more weather worn than the one we were just looking at. And then just to the right of the North Star building, you can see what once was an advertisement for Montgomery Ward and Feldstein Jewelers. Pretty cool. Speaking of cool, it's a bit out here today. Could really go for some hot cocoa. Fortunately, it looks like the Stone Cup Coffee House is already closed for the day. Wah, wah, wah. Guess I might have to stop at old Starbucks on the way out. With daylight fading and cold setting in, 
we pick up the pace making tracks for the 1300 block where we stop to point out a few of the local favorites before continuing on to our final destination. A couple more places I want to point out before we move on. Real quickly, this is Sakely's. It's a candy store that's been in operation since 1906. A local favorite. I hear their chocolate is just to die for. And then you have Lisa Ann's on the corner, Applewood's Eatery and Espresso Bar, and Rosie's Diner. And then we can't forget Ferdinand's Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, established in 1989, where you can dine in or take out. We're now up at the corner of South 16th and Ludington. And I want to end here because this building, if you didn't know, used to be the location of Richter Brewing Company. Built, oh, roughly about 1900, it was, as the name suggests, a brewery. Yes, Escanaba had its own beer making company. And that is until Prohibition set in here in Michigan in 1918. At which point they converted over to brewing non-alcoholic beverages. That lasted until Prohibition ended in 1933. They reopened under a new name called Delta Brewing Company and celebrated with the largest party ever in Escanaba's history. The party didn't last long. Eventually, the company went bankrupt and the brewery closed in 1940. Though not exactly an eerie tale of some long forgotten ghost, the hulking remains of this charming old brewery serve as a haunting tribute to Escanaba's past. Now, earlier I had mentioned that Al Capone was said to have visited this area. And actually, after doing some research, it does sound like there is some truth to that, that Escanaba was known to be one of the places that Al Capone spent time in. Given that, you gotta wonder, was Richter Brewing ever used to make bootleg liquor during Prohibition? Unfortunately, the answer to that question will have to wait for another day as we've just run out of time. Until next time, this is Sightseeing Salad.